Yes. Okay. Is this what you mean? What? Just delta right here? Like that? Or am I. Uh, Okay. So delta, and then you're saying delta prime. Is, is this your is this your suggestion? No. No, you need. Okay. No, no, you're 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 on the right track. Do you have an idea? Ah, that's exactly right. Okay. So, sorry, what was your name? Charlie. Charlie. So Charlie said, well, we're binding two new variables, A and B, so we have to give them types. And since, since T is a pair of A and B, um, A should be the type of the first component and B should be the type of the second component. Okay, and that, that's actually exactly right. So, yes? Yes. So how do you guarantee that the binds A and B are even exactly one, two, three, five? Uh, so, the, so, the, so the invariant of the system is that if, if, uh, delta, if, if T has the type A under delta, then every variable in, in delta is used precisely once. Um, and so here we're saying uh, all of the variables delta, delta prime are going to be used exactly once. And so that means that the context has to be divided among the subderivations. And in addition, we're binding two new variables. So in this subtree in T prime, we have to use A exactly once and B exactly once. And the way we enforce that is by putting it into the typing into the typing context of the of the uh, body of the pattern match. Does that, did that answer your question, or? Uh? Okay. Well, so um, yes. Yeah, so, so it'll it'll show up when we do a lookup, and we haven't put down the rule for that yet. Um, so we're, we're, we'll, we'll get there, and then it'll be the structure of the variable rule that'll enforce that. Yes? Um, isn't that the implicit application rule for subcontext parts? Since you have an issue where like, you can put a C on with like, a pair rule, and then later put something into like, half with C and half with another uh, let, Let's write down the rule for functions and, then you, and variables, and then you can, uh, we, we can come back to your question. Okay. Um, because it'll be easier to understand once we can actually uh, see the rules for it. it. It's a good question. We just need to pause for a minute. Okay, so in order to do that, we have to, we have to, get, to the, get to functions. So what we want to do is we want to say that um, lambda a dot t has the function type a lolly b. And just as with pattern matching, we're, we're binding a variable in a lambda abstraction. And so that means that uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say that we need to extend the context with the variable that needs to be used once in the body. And you can see, you can see that it looks an awful lot like the, uh, the function rule for the intuitionistic calculus sort of directly above it. Um, and now, uh, this should be well, the introduction. Now, what we can do is we can go to the uh, uh, we can go to the function case. So now, suppose that we want to say that t t prime has the type b. Um, so, what type should t have? Yes, uh, I don't know who said that, but someone I heard someone say a lolly b. So t should have the type a lolly b and t prime should have the type a yeah that's right okay and uh, <coughs> now uh, now 
again, we need, to, we need to divide our context appropriately. So does anyone have suggestions for how we should do that? Yes? That's right. So we'll, we'll, say, we'll say we have two subterms. So we'll divide the variable context into two parts, one for, one for the function, which will have the type A lollipop B, and the other for the argument, which has the type A. And if T uses delta and T prime uses delta prime, you can put the two together to get the, the variables used in the whole, uh, the whole body. Um, and now we get to the variable rule. And the way that we ensure that every variable is used exactly once is we restrict our variable rule compared to the variable rule for the intuitionistic case. So what we say is that the variable A has the type A when the context is A colon A. So what we're doing is we're saying, and we're saying that uh, um, we're allowed to use a variable when there's exactly one variable in the context and that, that has, the, has the right type. And now the idea, let's see what we can do here. Uh, let me write one typing derivation. Uh, oh. Okay. So I'm going to have to hide these rules. Um, I apologize. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hide them. I know what I'll do. I'll write it on... Uh, on the on the projector, and we'll find out how good my uh, my typing skills are. And let's lower this all the way down. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw an ASCII art typing derivation. Um, and what, this is going, what we're going to do is we're going to write a term that takes in N. So it's not going to be the world's most exciting program. It's just going to be a program that permutes a uh, That, that permutes an, a, an uh, a tensor B into a B tensor A. And the way that this will work is uh, we'll get in a pair. Let me just write the program and B in B A. So you can, you can see that this, is, this, this program shouldn't surprise you because we're saying we get, a, we get a, a variable P of the type A tensor B, we match it to get an A and a B, so we do some pattern matching here. And then once we have the A and the B, we can construct a pair that's the other way around. And um, sort of the only interesting thing that's going to happen is um, we, can, we can write down sort of the uh, the, the typing rules here. So we can say so what we're going to do is we're going to sort of writing a typing derivation from the bottom. What we can do is we can say if we have a um, oh, sorry let me pause one just one second. Uh, David is this visible on the Okay, I just wanted to make sure I didn't need to make it any bigger. Um, so what we're doing is we're saying we had the binder lambda p dot whatever for this function type, and now to type check the body, we assume we have a p of the right type, a tensor b, and now we want to type check the body. And you can see that going from the bottom to one line up, we've added one variable to the context. And now, what we've got is we're, we're doing a, a pair elimination. So we're, we're eliminating the tensor here. And so this means we need to divide the context into two, part, two pieces. Um, and in this particular case, 
there's only one uh, Uh, there's only there's only one variable, so uh, B four. So what we're going to do is we we have to. We have to find a way of constructing a, uh, of checking that P has the type uh, uh, A tensor B if we assume that P has the type A tensor B. And then we have to check the body here, B colon B comma A, assuming that A has the type A, B has the type B. So now, now, now this is the, the rest of the tree that we have to build. And what we can see, and so, so looking at this typing rule, we're saying, oh, we had to divide the context into two pieces. And the two pieces that we divided this context into were the single variable context P and the empty context. And to the empty context, we added the assumption that A has the type A and B has the type B. So if you wanted to be like, uh, that, that's really what we've done. We're saying we have the empty context and then we're adding A to it and we're adding B to it. And you know, showing that P has the type A tensor B when we only have the hypothesis uh, that uh, P has the type A tensor B is easy. That's exactly what our variable rule says we're allowed to do. Um, and notice that we're satisfying the restriction that the context has only one variable in it. And now what we need to do is we need to use the, we have a pair here, and so we need to use the pair introduction rule. So, and to do this, now we have to divide the context again. Um, and let me, we need to show that B has the type B. And we need to, we need to show somehow that A has the type A. And you know, how, how can we divide this context? Yes, that's right. So now, now we can use the, we can use the variable rule again for each of these. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to write the, the hypothesis rule there on the side because I'll run out of space. Um, so you can see what's, what's going on is that each time we, we deconstruct a term, like the, variable gets, the variables get routed to one side or the other. And um, the interesting, uh, so, there's, uh, so this, this is sort of what enforces that every variable is used at, at most once because it can only appear along one path of a, uh, of a branch. And the fact that uh, the hypothesis rule tells us that uh, um, the every variable must appear sort of guarantees that every variable does get used. Okay, so, what, what, so did this answer your question or do you have? Yes. Ah, okay. 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 Yes. So let me let me write down your question. So your question is, what if we had lambda a dot lambda a dot something? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, whatever that is. And so what what you're worried about is that this A gets the type A, this A gets the type B, and maybe you can use it in an inconsistent way. Um, yes, that, um, that's what alpha, alpha renaming is for. Um, and so th this problem actually also occurs in the ordinary lambda calculus. Like it doesn't have anything to do with linearity. Um, so the convention that's adopted is that 
uh, this is called the Baron Drecht connection. We've just been alighting. What? We've just been alighting. We've been alighting renaming. So the, so the silent invariant in like all type systems papers ever is that uh, all the variable names in the context are distinct. And um, what alpha renaming means is that uh, when you have when you have a a term, what? Yes. So we we, we just assert by fiat that uh, um, that lambda x dot e is equal to lambda y dot y for x in e. And so this Berendrecht convention says we want all of the variables in the context to have distinct names. And so um, we can avoid shadowing by just renaming before we, uh, before we push a binder into the context. Yes? Yeah, we have a slight variation of that. So let's say we've got two lambda names, one of them is standard type A, one of them is standard type B. Yes. Yeah, yes. So what, what, we'll, what, we, what we end up doing is we will say um, that this term right here, so, th so what we're going to do here is this, this can sort of be rewritten to, to this. Um, and so the, the A in that context won't be visible. Um, and in the case of the linear lambda calculus, this may lead to some uh, non-typeability issues. So it'll, you'll get your type checker if you implement it. will complain that you're not using a variable. So in fact, let us see what my compiler does. And this is dangerous because uh, let, it, let me see what I can do here. Okay, let me comment all this out. Okay. Um, you, can, you can safely ignore most of what I'm writing here. Um, all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sh shadow a variable and then this will, uh, this will make, the, make the compiler hopefully complain at me. Um, so we're what we're gonna do is we're going to say let x equals unit in let Unit in it's in, and then what can we just do? And let's see if I can actually compile this. Ah, yes. Oh wait, no. Let me. There is, it's complaining about something. A diff, it's a different compiler. Okay. <laughs> oh no, it, it was it was the correct error. Okay. So what what happened in this compiler is it's saying oh there's a uh, there is an unused var uh, it's saying unbound variable, but that's actually a typo. It's really uh, there's a, a a variable that's not getting used. So what we're doing here is we're binding x and then shadowing uh, to a unit and then we're shadowing that x. And then we're eliminating, we're eliminating, sorry, this one right here. What? Uh, no, you can't do that. Um, so what, what's happening is that this X is going unused and we're getting a compiler. error. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I think I think that would work. Um, it just sort of depends on what I did in my compiler. Uh, okay, so I think uh, it didn't like it. Um, I think it did some renaming, and then that was missing. Yes. What? Yeah. Uh, so I take out the second let. Let's see what happens. Whoops. Okay, let's try that and see what happens. Okay, it's still complaining, uh, it's still giving this error. So not, maybe it's not the right uh, error. It, maybe it's not the error that I think it's giving. Um, so let me 
So this part, I'm type check, so at least it did last night. Okay, so now let's introduce an unused variable and see what it does. Okay, and now it's complaining that this variable went. And let's see if it works or if we're going to discover a bug in my. Uh, Ah, uh, okay, so there's an error in my compiler. <laughs> okay. So the, the, now, you, now you see the risk of running research code in a demo when you haven't pre-vetted the research code. Okay. So anyway, what happens is, uh, uh, what happen so basically what happens is if you shadow a variable, there's no way for you to use it, and then you won't be able to type check it. Um, so be careful about that. Um, and uh, assuming you don't do that, then what you're going to end up doing is you're sort of dividing the variables among each subtree and the variable rule, which says that you use exactly the variable that's in your context will enforce that every variable gets used. Yes? Okay, so can you please suggest that uh, this rule is that every variable is used at most once? No, exactly once. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so if you, if, you, uh, if you say that a variable can be used at most once, that's called an affine type system. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's like different. Like I think this is what Rust does. Yes, did you have a question? What is para? What? What is para? Para what? P-A-R-A. -A. Para, oh. Um, so that's, that's the HTML paragraph tag. So this, uh, this, this, um, well, I'll show you in a minute. If you're, if you're really curious, what this is doing is uh, it's building a little HTML document and throwing it up on the screen. Um, so if you, P shell, oh. Okay, so let's make it. And now test one dot HTML. So, ah, there we go. So that's what it's doing. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll, we might, uh, depending on how much time we have, we might get into that later. Um, so yes, so, so that's not what I want. Okay, so what's, what's sort, of, sort of what's going on here uh, is that um, in particular, the thing I want to emphasize is that Right here, we have the co uh, context with um, A colon A and B colon B in it. And what we're doing is we're sending B to, this, uh, to the left side, and we're sending A to the right side. So this is the sense in which the order of the variables in the context doesn't matter. So the ordered logic you looked at with Frank, this program wouldn't type check because you're not using the variables in like the, the you know, sort of last in, first out order. Yes? Uh, you can write a constant function. Lambda x dot x is well typed. Uh, I mean con, so x, y. So ah, okay, yes. So. Uh, you can also not write a projection function. That's right. That's, the, that's right. Okay, so let me. So we were able to write this, and the, the two functions you were suggesting that you can't write in a linearly typed system. So. Um, so you can't write a projection function which says a o times b, say a, this is the first projection. So if you wanted to write a first projection function, let, let's actually go through this. This is a good example um, of what's impossible to write in a linearly typed system. So if you wanted to write this in, in Haskell or ML, what you, what you might do is you might say, okay, well, I'm going to get in a pair and I'll pattern match it. And then I'll just return the first component. And what will happen is we'll run into a problem. Uh, so let me just copy some of this to go, go by a little bit more quickly. And now we'll have a a b b. So 
So now we're going to do. So now we want to write this, and now we have a problem because we have we we need to use the the variable rule in order to assert that a has the type a, but we can't do that. This is ill-typed because there's two two hypotheses in this context, and you can only, you're only permitted to have one. So what's going on is that this second component b is unused, and um, a strict linear type discipline won't let you do that. Um, so another thing you cannot write is another, so, you know, let me put xxx here. Uh, another thing that you can't write, even more simply, is x dot. So you can't throw away a variable. So this, so this, this, uh, this ten, so this projection is, uh, can be can be can be shrunk down to like the the unit uh, to the can be boiled down to this right here where we're saying I want to take any variable and just return unit so this would be totally okay in ML or Haskell um, interest for that matter but in a in a linear type system this is uh, this is not okay because that x variable is not getting used um, and let's give you one more that you can't do so the, the another thing you cannot do is Lambda x so now now what will happen is uh, yeah. actually let me write a so now we'll say a and now what we do is we run into the problem that we need to divide the context in order to in order to uh, in order to build this pair, and we only have one hypothesis that uh, um, that A has the type A. So we could give it to either the first component or the second component, but then the second but then the other one wouldn't have the hypothesis. So we might be able to do oh A A, the first one has the type A, but then and that's fine. But then what we would run into is the problem that in the empty context, we need to prove that A has the type A, and we can't do that. So this is like, let me write this with the equals. So, so here the problem is that the, yes? Um, no. Uh, so, so what? So, why don't you suggest? Write. Tell me what to write down, and then. Ah, okay. So we have let a one equals a. No, but in brackets, let a be. Let a. Uh, a one. Okay. Yes, exactly. Uh, equals A. Uh-huh. Uh, A1 equals A2. So, yeah, in, in order for this to be well-typed, um, A has to be a pair. <coughs> and at pair type, this is just the identity function. Okay. And if it's not a pair type, it's just ill-typed. Yeah, so the, the inability to duplicate things, so the ability to duplicate things is uh, logicians for reasons I don't quite understand, they call it contraction. And so linear logic doesn't satisfy the contraction. Um, and the inability to, to drop things, oh sorry, this should be, the inability to drop things um, is called weakening. So we don't have contraction or weakening, but the one thing we can do is we can reorder hypotheses. And so if you have A tensor B, you can, you can swap it around and build a B tensor A because we are, specifically, we are specifically licensed to be able to reorder the context when we divide it. Okay, so is, uh, is th is this, uh, does this make sense? 
Or is there still is there some something st that's still fishy? Yes. I'm sorry for asking such a low-level question. Uh -huh. But I think I have to understand this to understand it fully. Mm -hmm. What does lambda p that let a be essentially in C? Ah, okay. I, mean, I guess I just don't really know what the let statement means. Okay, well, let's... Uh, uh, actually, wh while I'm here, I might as well. Okay, so let's zoom in here. Uh, get width. Kill this. And let me make it a bit bigger still. Okay. Okay, so what we are doing is there's, there's, uh, there's a... Uh, that's that's really too small. So. Um, so what we're doing is let me let me maybe I'll try writing it in uh, in Haskell or ML. So. Uh, okay. So the the function that I wrote is something like uh, let x uh, f equal fun p goes to let. A B equals P in B A, and let's run this. Uh, and so you can see, sorry, that what we're doing is we're saying here's a function definition, and we here's a lambda that's about, that takes an argument as P. And then we deconstruct it with pattern matching uh, into two subcomponents A and B, and then we put it together into a B comma A. And so you can see the type of it is it says um, if I have something of A times B, then I can build B times A. Um, so ba basically, what you are what you're getting confused by is my failure to indent the code. So um, so sort of a, a better style would be something like that. <laughs> so does that, does that, is that more readable? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but I, I was, I just wrote it this way because I was just trying to type the tree as fast as I could. Uh, okay. Any, any, any more questions? So low, le low level is good because the better you understand this, the less likely you are to, uh, to get confused later on. Okay, is, that, is, is everyone happy with this? Should I go on or should I, uh, okay. So now, okay, let's bring that up. So now that now the question comes up, um, why would you ever want a linearly typed language to begin with? And you saw last week that one idea is oh you can use it to model uh, concurrent programs and you can use the substructural nature in order to ensure that uh, you know that every every send is matched by a receive only like like protocols work out the way that they should. Um, another thing you can use it for is you can use it to say, um, to say that uh, um, if a variable is used only once uh, before it goes away, then an optimization that you can do when you compile a linear program is you can replace functional data structures with imperative ones. Um, and this will let you, this will let you uh, uh, ha have a language which has like a, um, a clean high level lambda calculus like semantics but which can be compiled to relatively efficient code um, and let me go back to that test and that's actually exactly what's going on right here so oops, I went to okay okay So what's what's so um, 
If you've ever programmed like uh, a web app in JavaScript or something, you'll have had to you'll have had to build build your program by manipulating the HTML DOM. And if you've used it, you know that this is an incredibly imperative API. So in order to build a, build a HTML document programmatically, what you do is you you create an object representing the uh, HTML document, and then like you issue mutation commands to update it with all the changes that you want to make to it. Um, so what you might do is you might create a box and then create some text and then update, the, update that box with that text and then add some more and then assign some properties to change the, to change the, uh, you know, the color or the font of your, of, your, uh, of your document. And then at the very end, you have, you have like sort of imperatively built up a document. And reasoning about these programs is quite challenging. Um, but what you can, but you know, this is this is the API that the uh, that the that the uh, uh, gods of the W3C have given to us, and so we have to cope with it somehow. And if you want, uh, if you want to present a functional API to this uh, to this mutable uh, to this you know this mutable underlying data structure, you can do so through like the medium of linear types. So what we're doing right here. Is this should uh, this should uh, is we are creating some text. So on line one, we're creating a paragraph that says "Hello World," and then on line two, um, what we're doing is let me see if I can. Uh, and then on line two here, we're creating another line of text, and now we're creating a root doc root document, which I'm calling W and then I'm updating this, uh, this W by attaching line one to it, and then I'm attaching line two to this document. I'm setting its color to red, setting the font family, and then returning that document. Um, and this, this you know, looks like this kind of state passing code that you might write in, uh, in Haskell or ML, but what it's, getting, what it's getting compiled down into is a bunch of update code. Um, so where you can see that the generated JavaScript looks uh, right here looks more or less like a one-for-one -one translation of the uh, of the uh, of the code that we saw, we saw a little bit earlier, and let me actually show you uh, how do I want to do this? Let me do this. Okay, so for the moment. Uh, let me give some colors here. So what we're, what we're doing, um, for the moment, ignore these Gs. I'll explain them in a moment. We, ha we have functions like color. And that says, if you give me a string, then I will take a DOM, I'll give you back a function which takes a DOM node and returns a new DOM node. And if you were writing, if you were writing this in ML or Haskell, what you'd do is you'd get a tree, update its color field with, uh, by building a new tree, and return that new tree. But what we're going to do here, let's see what, here is where what we're doing is we're saying that if you give me a widget, let's focus on the, this bit right here, what I will do is I will in place update its style with the appropriate color and then return that same widget. And so this is the thing that has the type dom node, lolly dom node. And so we're taking, a, we're taking a data structure, performing an update on it, and returning it. And this has a functional API, um, but it has an imperative implementation. Um, and this, uh, this allows you to, uh, to write programs which you can reason about and optimize as if they're functional programs, but you can compile and implement them using, uh, um, using, using imperative updates. And so, this is, this is sort of like the, one, of, one of the main motivations for, for using linear types in, uh, in programming. And now the question, though, is that we, all, we also saw, so, so hopefully seeing this assignment statement here makes you think, oh yeah, there's, there's like something like low level and awesome about linear types. Um, but at the same time, we've also seen that there are very basic things like duplicating a variable that linear types forbid you from doing. 
And so the question is like, okay, well, maybe I do want to implement a, a fast array processing algorithm in a functional style, but at the same time, you know, there's plenty of, of functional data structures that, that I don't want to use linearly. So is there any way to get these, uh, get, get these kinds of um, intuitionistic constructions and linear constructions to coexist with each other? And there have been, uh, there's been a lot of work on this, dating back from the, from the very beginning of the work on linear logic. But about 20 years ago, is that right? 21 years ago now, um, Nick Benton and Phil Wadler had an idea. They said, well, <coughs> what we can do is we have a linear type system and it's great. And you know, we have the intuitionistic lambda calculus and that's great too. Um, so the best way of combining them is to not combine them. And so what they did was they said, let's just have a linear type system that's completely that's a completely standard linear type system. And then let's add a completely into ordinary intuitionistic language. And then rather than trying to encode one in the other, what we'll do is we'll have both and then add some type operators to let you go from, from one world to the other. And so they said, well, <coughs> idea one is they said, well, let's add a, let's add a type constructor f of x. And what this is, is it's a, um, a linear value that carries, a, uh, that carries an intuitionistic value inside of it. So you can think of it as saying, well, if you have a value you're allowed to use as often as you like, you can use it one time. That's fine. Um, and conversely, um, the restriction on, uh, on linear things is that they have to use their values uh, you, uh, use all their variables exactly once. And that's why you can't duplicate an arbitrary linear term. So they said, well, that means that um, if, if a linear term has to use all its, all its free variables exactly once, then a linear term that doesn't have any free variables is something we can use as often as we like. And so then in the intuitionistic side of the world, they added a new type constructor. They wrote down G of A. Um, and this, was, this you can think of as the type of linear, uh, linear gadgets that have no free variables. And then they uh, added, added some typing rule, some, some introduction and elimination rules for F and G and you know, everything worked great. Um, and it worked out especially great because uh, it turned out that these, that these, two, uh, that these two type operators uh, well, formed an adjunction with, with respect to each other. And that, that gave them like a lot of really nice properties. Um, so let's, let's put down some new, some new introduction rules here. So G of P. And I'll modify, I'll modify the, the intuitionistic calculus first. So well, let me, t let me tell you how the judgments are changed first, and then I'll give you the typing rules. So what I've done right here is I've said that uh, I've left the typing judgment for intuitionistic terms alone. And that hasn't changed. But the shape of the typing judgment for linear terms has changed. Now, instead of having one, one context for its hypotheses, it has two. And it says, this linear term t has linear variables from delta and intuitionistic variables from gamma. And the sort of the programming intuition you can have for this is that um, because you're allowed to use uh, intuitionistic variables as often as you like, it's okay for them to occur inside of, uh, inside of linear terms. So we're saying here's a linear term, it uses the variables in delta exactly once, and it may use the variables in gamma as often as it likes. And so most of these rules are just going to pass through gamma unchanged everywhere. So we're just piping things through here. And you can see that I, was, I tried to be careful to leave myself a little bit of, of space to write gamma semicolon. Um, and so we've updated the judgment form for, for, the, 
for linearly typed terms, and now we can give introduction and elimination rules for, yes? <coughs> Uh, which one did I miss? Uh, introduction of of what? Right. Ah, yes, you're right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm pretty sure that the notes uh, the notes have this right. But if you any of you find any typos, send them to me and I'll fix them up. And now. Uh, and now we can actually give introduction and elimination rules for these, uh, for this, uh, for this G and uh, for this G and this F. Um, and I told you that you can think of uh, of elements of G of A as linear terms that don't have any free linear variables. And <coughs> we can we can turn that into that English description into a typing rule as follows. We can say in the context gamma. G of T has the type G of A. Just when T has the type A and it doesn't have any free variables in its linear context. And that's the, the, it's the, that's the whole introduction rule for G. And then there's going to be a little bit more that goes on right here. So we have, a, we have a way of, of producing an intuitionistic term representing a, uh, representing a closed linear computation, which means we should be able to turn a G into a linear computation. So what we'll do is we'll say, oh, if somehow, I manage to cook up a G of A, then in the empty linear context, I can, you know, I can I can evaluate it to get the A. I see Jason is squinting at this. Is it yes. Yes, the intuition for G is that an intuitionistic term is something that we can use as often as we like. And um, a linear term is one where all of its free variables have to be used exactly once. So that means that if you have a linear term which doesn't have any free variables, then you can copy that as many times as you like because you're, you're using its, z for, its zero free variables exactly once, no matter how many times you copy it. Okay, so do you have a? So, uh, let's run the. Yes. So, run the part of the linear term. Yes. So, what we're doing is we're saying, oh, I have an intuitionistic computation which gives me a G of A. And because, because uh, all the intuitionistic terms live on the, uh, on the right side of the board over here and all of the uh, linear ones live on the left side of the board, we need to have some, some term to put one into the other. So what we're doing is we're saying, oh, I have a G of A and running it will give me an A. And because notionally this is a, this is a closed linear term, it doesn't, have, it doesn't use any, any linear resources to, to execute it. And now, We'll, we need to have some, some rules for f. And just as with the g, we, we had a way of embedding a, uh, uh, a linear term into, an intuitionistic, into the intuitionistic calculus, we'll do the same thing. We'll say f of e is an introduction, is an introduction form for the, uh, uh, for, the, for the f of x linear type constructor. It'll say, OK. If E has the type X intuitionistically, then you don't need any linear resources to produce an F of X. And now we need an elimination form for F. And this is a little bit subtle because what we would really like to do is we'd like to know 
that once we have an f of x, we'd like to be able to use it several times. Um, and the, the, the issue is that when you get a term of type f of x, maybe you did use some linear variables to produce it. So we use some linear resources to produce an intuitionistic value. How can we use that resulting intuitionistic value several times? And the answer is we can turn to our old friend pattern matching again. And what we will do is here, we'll say that if we can produce a linear term of type f of x, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we needed some linear, linear resources to produce f of x, and t prime will need some linear resources of its own, which we'll put into delta prime. And what we can do is we can say, but once we've got this, this intuitionistic value of type x, we can use that as often as we like. And we can do that by saying p prime can refer to, this in, to an intuitionistic variable, which is what will bind the result of f of x to. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, if you give me an f of x, then um, you, can, you can bind the f of x to a variable, to an intuitionistic variable x, and then use it to, uh, to uh, as often as you like in your construction of t prime. So to, to make that point a little bit clearer, let me write one derivation and then I think I will run out of time for today. So what we'll do is we'll show how f of x can be used to, produ can be used to produce two f of x's. So in general, this isn't, this isn't okay for a linearly typed term. You can't send a, we, we learned that it's not possible to send an a to a tensor a, but in the specific case of, uh, of f of x, we will be able to duplicate it. And so, lambda a okay. and what we're going to do So, you know, as, as, as before, we started with this lambda. <laughs> what? Oh, is the projector off? Okay. Okay. Okay, there we go. So what we're going to do is down at the bottom, we're starting in an empty, con whoops. We're starting in an empty context. There's no intuitionistic <laughs> variables and no linear variables. And then the lambda rule says, okay, you can add this linear variable A, which has the type F of X. And then, Now, now that we have this, uh, uh, now that we have this, we can use the variable rule to conclude that uh, a has the type f of x. And now, um, we're, we're using the f elimination rule, and we know that x has the type x. And we want to show that f of x, s comma f of x has the type uh, um, f of x tensor f of x. And let me only write one of these because 
the, the two sides of the pair are identical. So here, what we need to do is we need to show that as the type in the context and to show this what we need to do is we can use the f introduction rule and now we need to show that x colon x which you know you get from the intuitionistic variable rule and then for the other for the other component we're going to have uh, a, a derivation exactly like this yes so, so do we now have so we have a we have a constant function in the intuitionistic segment we don't have one in the pure linear segment is yeah there, is there now with this big f and big g some sort of mixed constant function that we can have uh, yes. So what you can do is, so here you can write f of x can be duplicated. And similarly, you can write, you can give a term that says uh, if f contains a, uh, um, an intuitionistic thing, you can, you can drop it as well. So like this kind of contraction and weakening become admissible for, uh, for these intuitionistic types. Um, so um, did, did Frank sh talk to you about exponentials last week? Like this bang type? No, okay. So we, we now uh, mix many of these two languages together, but do we still have two languages or do we have one? Uh, we now have one language, but we have like, uh, we have sort of like two subsystems that are connected to each other. Um, so if, you, if you've done, uh, programming in like uh, Haskell or something, you, you're sort of used to the phenomena that you have a sort of uh, um, pure, pure functional language and then an imperative sub-language in the IO monad. And this is, a, this is kind of the same idea where we have, a, uh, we have a intuitionistic calculus and a linear calculus and they're both subsystems of this larger language. Okay, so do we have one type system or two? Yes, we have, one, we, have two, we have one type system but two sorts of types. Yes, in the back. Uh, yes, this should be a turnstile. Does that make sense now? Okay. Yes, yeah, it should be, it should be a turnstile. Um, uh, sorry, did I, did I answer your question? About having one, who is, who is asking me about one language versus two? Yes. Yeah, so, so there are two languages. They sort of live on uh, on th there are two sub-languages of one larger language, and they sort of are, the connection between the two is mediated by, the, by, this, uh, by these pair of type constructors, F and G. Because, so, um, I mean, when we, when we have like a program uh -huh. in the language, then, it's, then the top level expression will either be A or it will be A. Yeah. And both are possible. Yeah, both are possible. It depends on what your runtime system me me needs, what, what type main should have. So in the, uh, uh, let me go here. So in, the, in this particular language that I implemented, it, uh, the, the definition of main, which was slightly arbitrary, said, give me a closed linear computation I can feed to the runtime to kick things off and build like a, build like a document. And so what, you, what we've got is this main function and then the runtime system will evaluate it and hook it up to the, uh, hook it up to the, to the, to the scene graph. But that, but that is sort of a, sort of a, a, a choice dictated by like, you know, here's the, here's the runtime system that, I'm, that I've got and how, how do I want to hook up to it? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, so in, in, this, uh, in this setting, um, everything is total. So 
there's no difference between call by value and call by name. Um, and in general, in a linear system, it's basically impossible to tell the difference between call by value and call by name because, um, uh, let me see, where did this go? Uh, let, me, let me just point at this function type here. So the meaning of a lolly b means that a is a computation that is guaranteed to be used. And so you're, in fact, it's guaranteed to be used once. And so the difference between call by name and call by value is just when the argument is evaluated exactly once, um, but not whether it's evaluated at all. Yes? Uh, why would you want, okay, so um, an example, so, there, so the reason you want to distinguish the two is because, um, uh, so for instance in ML, ML has the ref type constructor for, uh, for pointers and um, the existence of, of, refer of pointers along with the ability to assign to them means that uh, lots of optimizations become unsound because you can't, you can't uh, copy expressions in general and you can't like do common sub expression in general because you might you might change the number of times that you uh, that you perform an assignment and so um, so you have like a you have a, a much more restricted equational theory but when when things are when things are linear then you know that every every action is going to happen exactly once and so the full the full equational theory of the lambda calculus still holds um, and so this so this uh, this lets you keep the full equational lambda uh, theory of the lambda calculus but at the same time use an efficient efficient imperative data structures if you like um, <coughs> Or if you're, if you're not doing stateful programming, if you're doing concurrent programming, this will guarantee things like, you know, um, the two sides of a protocol will, you know, send once for each receive or something like that. So if you need to, if you need to, or guarantee that every file that's opened is closed exactly once. So it, it, lets, you, it lets you maintain protocol invariance in a nice way. Uh, any more questions? Yes. Uh, this morning when I talked about uh, the system as sort of like a syntactic way of guaranteeing some symmetric property. Yes. I'm curious if there's like a nice symmetric property that you get from linearity. Or like in other words, if you've done your typing rules wrong, yes. you've done them so that you accidentally like duplicate something somewhere. Yeah. Is there like a twist you could do that would break the like, uh, Yes, we'll, we'll actually see that in the next lecture. Um, so the, 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 Let's see how do how do I how do I say this? So um, if you if you look at the categorical semantics of of this particular calculus, um, you know you can axiomatize it by saying okay the intuitionistic side should be a Cartesian closed category and the linear side should be a monoidal closed category and f and g should form an adjunction between these two categories, um, and you can what you can do is you can say oh I want to implement a state or uh, or non-determinism this way, then what you'll do is you'll check that the equations are all sat that you want to, that all the typing rules satisfy all the equations that you want um, in, a, in a particular model. And what we'll do, what we'll do starting tomorrow is we'll look at a one particular model of, of uh, using linear types to model state. And then you'll, then you'll be able to see how you're, how you're able to validate these kinds of equations. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>